How's everybody tonight? Hey, let's uh, let's go before the Lord and pray. Father God, we lift this time to you, Lord. We pray that you meet us here, God, that you'd uh, inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, we want you to be honored, glorified in this place. So, uh, God, I pray that uh, you would just be with us, Lord. We might turn our eyes on you, allow the, the stuff of this day to wash away, even uh, as the rain is washing things away. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would... Uh, just be with us tonight. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's worship. That's a good start, right? I thought about doing it there anyway. I can go low, but I don't know if everybody else can get down there. Who am I that the highest king would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me in. Oh, his love for me. Oh, his love for me, whom the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of Yes, I am. Free at last, he has ransomed me. His grace runs deep. While I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free. Oh, it's free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. Yes, I am who you say I am. Who the sun sets free. Oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house. There's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Oh, I am who you say I am. 
Yes, I am who you say I am, who the Son set free. All is free indeed. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. In my Father's house, there's a place for me. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I'm a child of God. Yes, I am. I wasn't sure I would remember how to play guitar. You never forget. Uh, God's good, isn't he? He's our hope. no 
one like you. There is none beside you. you open up my eyes in wonder. Show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to those around me. And I will build my life
I'm not backing down from any giant I know how this story ends oh, I know how this story ends I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Take what the enemy meant for evil and you turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. Turn it for good, he turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil, he turn it for good, he turn it for good. Oh, I'm gonna see a victory, I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs. see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory for the battle belongs to you, Lord. Father God, we just thank you for this time, Lord, that we can uh, put our eyes on you. Uh, God, we know that uh, no matter how crazy life gets, how wild things look, all things are progressing according to your story. So, Lord, we look forward to your deliverance, God. We look forward to your victory, God. And we ask that as we turn our eyes to your word, God, that you would give us eyes to see and ears to hear, that our hearts would be ready to receive the word that you have for us tonight, God, that you be glorified and magnified in this place, and we'll give you all the praise in Jesus' name, amen. Is it muggy out there? Just hot up here? Man. That's what I get for wearing a long sleeve shirt in a summer thunderstorm. Hey, if you got your Bibles, we're going to be in Jeremiah chapter 31, which should be an exciting thing for us because uh, that is the section of Scripture that deals with what the Bible calls the New Covenant. Um, if you remember, we've talked about it a few times. The book of Jeremiah is not divided chronologically. It's grouped. His prophecies are grouped under topics, subjects. The beginning, chapter 1, is a call of Jeremiah. After that, we have the judgment from God against Judah and Jerusalem. Then he dealt with a section focused on the false prophets. 
And now we're looking at a section focused on the restoration. Every time God spoke about the judgment that would come against uh, Judah, he also, spoke about, he also spoke about their restoration. God's heart was <clears throat> not their destruction, but uh, to lead them to correction, repentance, and renewal. And so tonight we'll see this concept laid out for us as we discuss a little bit about the new covenant. So we're going to pick it up in verse 1. In order to pick it up in verse 1, we're going to have to back up to, uh, to earlier verses. <clears throat> if we look at, uh, we'll go back to Jeremiah 30, 23. It says, Behold the storm of the Lord, wrath has gone forth, a whirling tempest. It will burst upon the head of the wicked. The fierce anger of the Lord will not turn back until he has executed and accomplished the intentions of his mind. In the latter days, you will understand this. Watch the flow to verse 1. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the clans of Israel, and they shall be my people. When we come to the chapter and verse divisions in the Bible, those come long after the Bible was completed. Chapter and verse divisions is something we put in later on to find our way. And if you look at the flow from chapter 30 to 31, I think it's pretty evident that verse 1 flows right along with what God was talking about in the time of Jacob's trouble. We talked about that last week, talked about kind of a, a bird's eye picture of eschatology and the end of days, the tribulation period, God's focus on, on Israel. And uh, Paul echoed this same sentiment that uh, in, in Romans chapter 11. So if you look at Romans chapter 11, you can also see as uh, Paul would declare that uh, as a nation, they're going to turn back to the Lord. They're going to look upon him whom they have pierced. So as we come uh, in Jeremiah 31, we pick up in verse two, it says, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, the people who survived the sword found grace in the wilderness. When Israel sought for rest, the Lord appeared to him from far away. Now, he's going to make a comparison between the exodus and the exile. The exodus is a picture of how God developed the nation. If you remember, when the Lord spoke to Abraham in the Abrahamic covenant, he told him, look, your guys, your people, your family, this nation that I'm promising to you, they're going to spend 400 years in captivity, but when they come out, they're going to be a mighty nation. God developing them from a family, 70, to millions perhaps. At the end of their time of captivity, the struggle that they went through in Egypt. Now he's aligning that with the idea of the exile. You're going to go to exile for 70 years, but you're going to come back. You're going to come back. And ultimately what you're going to do is you're going to finally find the grace of God in rest, experiencing the grace of God. Jesus told us in the New Testament that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. He is God, he is the God of rest. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest, right? The scriptures would indicate for us that the Sabbath rest that the people are longing for, that, that day of rest that's found in Christ, and so we want to enter into that day of rest. We want to enter into that place in Christ. And he's saying, look, they're going to. They're going to find God's grace. And as they find God's grace, here's what they'll learn. Verse 3, for I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. They're going to find God's grace and they're going to understand the truth, the fact about God's love. Let me ask you a question. How long is everlasting love? Yeah, so does God not love them anymore? No. No, God still has a plan and a purpose for the nation. Paul would write in Romans, Romans 9, 10, 11, as he focuses his attention on the nation of Israel and the fact that God has um, cut off their branch and grafted on the branch, the church, the Gentiles, the goyim. He also says that in the same way that he did that, he can put them back on. And this is what the scriptures are talking about, that day of restoration. 
that day when God will fulfill the promises that he made to their forefathers. Therefore, I have continued my faithfulness to you. How many of us know that God is faithful long after we're not? Great is your faithfulness, right? We'll see that in Lamentations when we get there. But the idea, so here's what's happening. We see the re, we're going to talk about the return of the north and the return of the south and the blessing of Israel. One, they're going to find God's grace. Two, they're going to know God's everlasting love and faithfulness. Verse four, he says, again, I will build you and you will be built, O virgin Israel. So who does the work? Who's going to restore them? God's going to do it. What did he say? I will build you and you shall be built. God's going to do it. And you shall adorn yourself with tambourines and go forth in the dance of the merrymakers. Again, you will plant vineyards in the mountains of Samaria and the planters will plant and enjoy the fruit. So he wants them to understand this restoration, this is not something that they can strive for. We, they're not to strive for it. What are they to do? They're there to find the grace of God, which was symbolized by what? Entering into rest. They're going to enter into rest. Who's rest? The rest of Messiah. The rest of Jesus. He's the rest. When they enter into that rest, they recognize the, the everlasting glory of God, the everlasting love of God, his faithfulness, and he will restore their joy and he will restore their harvest. Keep in mind, while this is going on, they're being led away in chains, right? So God's saying, look, there's, there's sorrow now, but joy's coming. He goes on in verse 6, he says, For there will be a day when watchmen will call in the hill country of Ephraim, Arise, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. Now, you know what the watchman's job was? The watchman's job was to watch for enemies. But he's saying there will be a day when the watchman's not going to be there to watch for enemies. He's going to be there to sound it's time to go to worship. It's time to go to Zion. Zion's a picture for them, the mountain of God. To go into that place, God's presence, enter into him. Realizing that, that scripture would lay out for us this idea that God is the only all-satisfying being in the universe. And if we truly can catch a glimpse, lay our, lay our hands on, taste and see that the Lord is good, then we'll understand the watchman announcing, hey, it's time to go be in God's presence. It's time to go be with him. Because he's the source of joy. He's the source of harvest. He's the source of satisfaction. He's the source of love. He's the source of faithfulness. He is the source of grace. He's everything we need. So the watchmen, rather than watching for enemies, are going to say, hey, let's go into the presence of God. For thus saith the Lord, verse 7, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob. Raise shouts for the chief of the nations. Proclaim, give praise, and say, O oh Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Reminds me of what the nation of Israel cried out as Jesus entered into Jerusalem. You know how they said it? Hosanna. Save now. Save us. Save your people. The Lord says they're going to sing aloud with gladness. For Jacob, I love that... I don't believe in accidents, and it just doesn't happen that God switches back and forth from Israel to Jacob. Israel was the identity of Jacob after he surrendered himself to the Lord, right? You shall no longer be called Jacob. Uh, you're going to be Israel, governed by God, prince of God. You know, people may argue over what it means, but nobody argues over what Jacob means. Jacob means loser, liar, deceiver. And the reality is what that, what that picture, the picture that that draws is that here we were broken. Jacob's broken. But he will be Israel, healed, set free, made whole. 
And so he's saying, sing aloud with gladness for Jacob, for the broken. Raise shouts to the chief of the nations, the goyim, the Gentile. Every time you see the word nations, in, especially in the Old Testament, it's the word goyim. It's the Gentiles. So he's saying, sing for Jacob, the symbol of brokenness. Raise shouts for the chief of the Gentiles. Proclaim and give praise and say, O oh Lord, save your people. All celebrating in that day. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 11. And I'll, I'll try not to keep going back to the idea. But Paul says, if their brokenness brought about your salvation and joy, what celebration will happen on the day when they're restored? And that's here what Jeremiah is seeing in, in this idea, this restoration of the northern kingdom, which has already gone, been gone for 150 years at the time Jeremiah wrote this. So the Lord says in verse 8, Behold, I will bring them from the north country, gather them from the farthest parts of the earth, among them the blind and the lame, the pregnant woman who is in labor, together, a great company, and they shall return here. Listen, with weeping they will come. And with pleas for mercy, I will lead them back. I will make them walk by brooks of water in a straight path in which they will not stumble. For I am a father to Israel, and Ephraim is my firstborn. Man, he's saying, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring you back. And I love the picture. There was a time, Jesus talking about the time of Jacob's trouble. We discussed it last chapter. What we would call the tribulation period. And, and he's looking at it, and he says, man, when you see these things happen, woe to you who are pregnant. Woe to you who are with child, because these days are going to be really hard, Right? Pray that it doesn't happen on the Sabbath. Pray that you're going to be able to escape these things which shall come to pass. But here the Lord, in talking about the restoration, he says, I got you all. I got the blind, the lame, the pregnant woman, she who is in labor, giving birth. And he's saying, together, a great company, I will lead you. You will return here. With weeping you will come. That's not weeping over sorrow. That's weeping over their, their lostness, their brokenness, and the beauty of seeing their Savior calling them forward. With pleas of mercy. Look, we get another picture of this in Zechariah 12.10. In Zechariah 12.10 it says, And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace. And please for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And they're going to look at him and they're going to say, where did you receive these wounds? You've been pierced. And Jesus responds, in the house of my friend. John chapter 1 says that he came into his own, but his own did not receive him. That he did not come to condemn the world. The world was already condemned, but he came to do what? To save. The path of salvation led to the cross. That's the only way. And that's the groundwork that's being laid here in the restoration of Israel. As Israel will be restored, one day there will be a restoration. It has not happened. Are they a nation today? Sure. Less than 10% of Israel has any type of Judaic faith at all. That's not, that's not what the Bible's talking about. What the Bible's talking about is them looking upon Jesus on the one whom they pierced, and weeping, mourning, as one mourns for an only son. This is, what, this is the restoration that he's talking about, a, a restoration for joy. He's going to do this. Look, they're not going to get lost. He says, it'll be in a straight path. They will not stumble, for I am a father to Israel. I love how the book of Jude ends. Now unto him who is able to keep you from falling. What, who keeps me from falling? My willpower? How many of you got willpower that keeps you from falling? Yeah, nope, not very many. Not very many. But the reality is, it's Christ, right? Now unto him who is able to keep me. It's his great joy to present me before the Father without blame. 
do I have blame? Yeah, I got blame. Are you kidding? Get behind me on my motorcycle any day of the week. And you will say, I don't think Jackie's saved. Because <laughs> the saved guy won't ride like that. He would go the speed limit, follow all the laws. I just can't do it. <laughs> I try. Well, I don't know if that's true. I don't know if I try. But look, we, the point is that it's Christ that gives us the ability to become more, right? To overcome the frailties within our own nature. So he goes on. Hear the word of the Lord, O nations, and declare it in the coastlands far away. Say, he who scattered Israel will gather him and will keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. That reminds you of something? David wrote something. What is that? Psalm 23? How's that go, Jay? <laughs> the Lord is my shepherd. That's right. The Lord is my shepherd. He will keep them, keep him as a shepherd keeps his flock. For the Lord has ransomed Jacob and has redeemed him from hands, what's it say? Too strong for him. As we talk about the new covenant, and we'll see how far we get, because there's 40 verses. This, that's a lot for Jackie to do. We'll see how that works out. But when he says from hands too strong for him, we're going to look at multiple covenants when we discuss the new covenant. And the point of all these covenants, they're, they're reaffirmations, some of them of the covenant before them. Um, <clears throat> they're, they're covenants where, where God's um, uh, providing a way for a weakness, perhaps, that was experienced in an earlier covenant because the people aren't able to keep it, people aren't able to keep it, people aren't able to keep it. Here the scripture says the Lord has ransomed Jacob. He's paid for the broken man, right? He paid for him and not only ransomed him and redeemed him. That means he's twice his. Twice. He ransomed, he paid a price Jacob couldn't pay, and he redeemed him. He redeemed him. He's going to make the broken man what he could never be on his own because he's trapped. He's in bondage in hands that are too strong for him. Probably one of my favorite memories as a father, wrestling with the boys. And I, I, I do this thing when we're wrestling where I put them in jail. I don't know if you guys do that or have ever done it. Jail is, dad's kind of tired of wrestling, so I just throw you in jail. So you've got a giant bear hug on you, and then I say, you got to break out. So they never get out if I don't let them out, right? Usually what occurs immediately afterwards is screaming for mom. Mom! And then mom screaming at dad, leave the kids alone. And then me eventually opening up the door to the jail. And I think that's similar to what the Lord's talking about here because he's saying, look, he's in, he's being held by hands he can't get out of. That is what is being taught by the old covenant. The old covenant, all of them are teaching that we aren't able, that we aren't able, that we can't get out of the hands in which we are, are, are caught, where we are stuck. So he's saying the Lord will ransom, the Lord will redeem, and they shall come and sing aloud on the height of Zion. I love this next line. And they will be radiant over the goodness of God. Uh, here's another way to say that. They will be satisfied in the goodness of God. They're going to discover that God is really everything we've ever sought. Everything that ever captured our attention, whether it was new house or a new car or a new relationship or a pet or an animal or success in career, all of those are pale little tastes of what is ultimately fulfilled in a relationship with God when he is our God and we are his people. So he says on that day when they come, when he's redeemed, when he's ransomed and he's brought them in, they will be satisfied with the goodness of the Lord. We wrestle with that today because we don't actually believe that God is all satisfying. We have so many other things that can cloud our vision. But one of the tests to know that all those things we chase 
can't really satisfy is how short the satisfaction lasts, right? For 13 years, I had a goal to win a state championship football game. And me and the kids on the team, we'd sit around and talk about the day when we could get a ring. You know where that ring is now? Sitting on a windowsill in the kitchen. I hadn't had it on my finger in forever. What once was this incredible goal, right, became just another thing that didn't actually satisfy. You know what I mean? But there are times when I'm sitting down in my office and I'm studying the Word and the and the little tastes, the little glimpses of the glory of God that come through his word when I'm in it, those, I'm always surprised at how much satisfaction comes through that. And then the desire is for more of that. The Bible says now we see through a glass dimly, right? We, we, we don't quite have the eyes to see it all. But there will be a day when you will look into his face And I will tell you, you would be satisfied to stand in that place and look at his face forever. We've been let down by so many other things that have tried to to garner our affections that we struggle with believing there could be something so totally satisfying. But I promise you that one all-satisfying one is the Lord our God. They will be radiant over the goodness of the Lord, over the grain, the wine, the oil, the young of the flock and the herd. Their life shall be like a watered garden, and they will languish no more. I think for the last 10 years, uh, Kathy and I have tried to do a garden that has had to languish. Uh, This year, I think we got it. I think we have a well-watered garden, so our garden is rejoicing. But in the past, we had struggled with providing all the things that it needed to actually become a fruitful garden. You understand what the Scripture is telling us. Why is it a well-watered garden? Because it's with Him. Because we're in His presence. We become that well-watered garden, not languishing like we do here, but enjoying that presence of the Lord. Then shall the young women (coughs) rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry, and I will turn their mourning into joy. Again, how does that occur? We talk about that here, right? That the joy comes in the evening, or I'm sorry, sorrow is for the evening, but joy comes in the morning, right? That the point is that there's a day when our eyes will close to all the sorrow here and open to eternal joy. Why? Why does it open to eternal joy? Because we're in his presence. And in the presence of God is joy everlasting. All the things we try to fill it with will be fulfilled there. He says, I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. I will feast the soul of the priests with abundance, and my people will be satisfied with my goodness, declares the Lord. My people will be satisfied with me. How many times, maybe in your human relationships, perhaps in your marriage or friendships or other other relationships you've had with other people, how many times have you been frustrated feeling like, I'm not enough? This person, this friend, this other one in my life, they're not satisfied with my goodness. We know what that's like. We experience a a bit of it here. But when we're there, you will understand the everlasting love of God, the grace of God, the beauty of God, and you will be satisfied in Him. He is is enough. He is enough. And so the northern kingdom is going to be experiencing this. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping, 
Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. That's just sound familiar, right? If you've ever read the book of Matthew, that comes up after Herod kills the slaughter of the, of the two-year-old and under, right? Rachel weeping for her children. Here's what I want you to understand about this metaphor, this picture that Jeremiah is describing. Rachel never got to weep for her children. She died when Benjamin was born. Rama is where she's buried. The metaphor is that Rachel, watching over her children, Joseph and Benjamin and their offspring, out of Joseph's going to come Ephraim and Manasseh. They're going to be very plentiful tribes. And it's saying now in the exile, she's weeping. She's weeping because they're out of the land. Why, why is that a big deal? Do you realize how much time you and I spend trying to find a place we can call home? It doesn't matter where the land is. There's nothing in particularly special about the rocks in Jerusalem. God just said this is going to be home. So we spend so much effort and so much of our time trying to find our home. Where's my home? Where's that place where I belong? Abraham looked for a city that had foundations, whose maker and builder was the Lord, a place he could call home. He lived his whole life in a tent. What does that mean? It's temporary, right? What do you do with a tent? You set it up. What else do you do? You take it down, and you move. Then you put up a tent. We're longing for a home. The Lord is declaring here that that the land, there is a home for Israel. There will be a return. Right now he's saying, look, Rachel's weeping because the children are exiled, but don't stop there because the next verse says, thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping. Don't cry. Don't cry. Your eyes from tears, for there is a reward for your work. What was their work? What is it that God declares when he says, when, when someone come to Jesus said, Lord, what must I do to do the works of God? What do I got to do? Believe in me. What's the work that these people going into exile, what was the work they were supposed to do? The work that they were supposed to do is to trust God. Trust God. God says, I know the plans I have for you. Isn't that what he told us in chapter 29? I know the thoughts that I think toward you, thoughts of good and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. Trust me. When he came to Abraham and he says to Abraham, he he lays out the covenant. Abraham, I'm going to give you a land, home. I'm going to make of you a nation. I'm going to give you a family. Did Abraham have any kids? He's 75 years old. What's the last time somebody told a 75-year-old man, hey, you're going to have so many kids, they're going to call your people a nation. What does the very next part of the Genesis tell us? Abraham did what? Believed God, and what happened? It was accounted unto him for righteousness. Listen to what he says. There is a reward for your work. They shall come back from the land of the enemy. This is not the end. There is hope for your future, declares the Lord. And your children shall come back to their own country. He says, I have heard Ephraim grieving. Ephraim didn't exist. They're 150 years gone. The people left in the place where Ephraim was is the Samaritans. You remember at the time of Jesus, the Samaritans were considered mixed breed, right? They were were all mixed up. They wrote their own scripture. They got all sideways. They got all crazy. The Lord says, I hear Ephraim weeping. I still hear him. And I have a purpose in the place where he is at. You know, one of the things I love, absolutely love, here you have the Samaritans hated by the Jews, did everything wrong. They they built their own temple. It's still there. 
you can still, you want to know what a sacrifice looks like? You go to the temple of Samaritans in Israel. They still do sacrifice. Their temple's still there. You can go up and see it. You can watch, uh, well, I assume you can. Somebody filmed it once. You can, you can watch them sacrificing the, <coughs> the Passover lamb, but their, their scriptures are all mixed and mingled and changed and, and adjusted because of them trying to develop their own way. But there was a day Jesus told his disciples, you know what? I need to go to Samaria. Let's, let's go. Lord, you don't need to go there. There's Samaritans there. Them guys are screwed up. They're, they're, you think we're broken. We're just normal broken. But those people, man, those people are real broken. That's like the Antifa of the Old Testament. Oh, I don't know. Is there any hope for them? For sure. Jesus goes, sits down by Jacob's well. You guys know the story, right? Talks to a Samaritan woman. She comes face to face with her Messiah. Goes and tells on her, all her friends, come and see. So many people come to Jesus from her voice that Jesus prompts Jesus to say, look, the fields are white with harvest. Pray the Lord of the harvest send what? Workers. Workers to the fields. Hey, I get just as frustrated as the next guy. I can't hardly watch the news. I can't. I, I, it's, it's crazy watching our nation be torn apart. And the answer is not going to be how many bullets I got. The answer is going to be pray the Lord of the harvest. Send workers to the field because there's a lot of hopeless people out there who are so hopeless they're trying to burn down their own world. And we have hope. The Lord is saying, I hear Ephraim grieving. Here's what Ephraim is saying. Ephraim says, you have disciplined me and I was disciplined. Like an untrained calf, bring me back that I may be restored. For you are the Lord my God. Who could bring Ephraim back? Ephraim can't bring himself back. You can't bring yourself back. I can't bring myself back. But what is Ephraim doing? He's calling out on the Lord. He's, the Lord said, I hear Ephraim grieving. You disciplined me and I was disciplined. I was an untrained calf. I'll go wherever I want to go. I'm finding myself in my own bits of trouble here and there. Lord, you, you sent me to this. I... <clears throat> I have turned away. You bring me back, God. Don't you see when Jesus told Nicodemus in John chapter 3, Nicodemus, don't you understand? You must be born again. God does that. God does that. It's God who regenerates us. What do we do? We do what Ephraim did. Lord, Ephraim grieved. I am disciplined. I have turned away. Verse 19, I relented after I was instructed. The word of God brings instruction, calls us to repentance. I struck my thigh. I was ashamed. I was confounded because I bore the disgrace of my youth. So you have Ephraim, the pictures you have, Ephraim crying out to God, God, restore me, God, fix me, God, I'm a mess, I'm broken, I'm screwed up, God. And then you see God's answer. Look at it, he says, Ephraim, is Ephraim my dear son? Is he my darling child? For as often as I speak against him, I do remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. Now, if you close your eyes when you consider this, you can see the story of the prodigal God and the father waiting on his porch for the return of his son. Is Ephraim my son? 
my darling child, as often as I spoke against him, I do remember him still. Therefore, my heart yearns for him. I will surely have mercy on him, declares the Lord. What did the father do? He threw his arms around him, right? What does God do when, when man on earth rec recognizes his need and cries out for God? What does God do? He does what only he can do. That's the only way we get born again, not by doing something, not by, by accomplishing them, something, not catechism, not baptism, not anything, but what you see Ephraim crying out here. So the Lord says, verse 21, set up road markers for yourself. Make yourself guideposts. Consider well the highway, <coughs> the road by which you went. Return, O virgin Israel. Return to these your cities. You notice how many times in this prophecy Jeremiah has called Israel virgin Israel? Do you know how many scriptures where God calls Israel a whore? But you see, when Israel turns, her past is cleansed. She is restored in God's sight, renewed in his sight. Return to these, your cities. Now, in verse 22, we see the return of the south. That's Judah. So most of Jeremiah has been focused on Judah. Here it says, how long will you waver, O faithless daughter? For the Lord has created a new thing on the earth. Oh, that sounds familiar too. One of my favorite pieces of scripture in Revelation, looking at the throne of God, Revelation 21, we, we see this beautiful thing, talking about Jesus, and then Jesus says, see, I make all things new. If, if you've watched the Passion of the Christ, one of my favorite, favorite parts of that movie too is while Jesus is carrying the cross up to to the the mount where he will be crucified if you watch some one of the times when he stumbles uh, I think it's when in the movie they show him seeing his mother he says see I'm making all things new well that's when he was doing it he was providing for regeneration for the transformation that we'll see in the new covenant. Because they haven't been able to be transformed. What do, you, what do you get frustrated about when you read the Old Testament? How many times does Israel screw up? All the time. Over and over and over and over and over. That's all man can do under his own power. Until the new covenant. When God transforms man. Isn't that what he, he's going to write for us? We're never going to get there tonight. You have to come back next week to see it. But we will get through the south. How long will you waver? For the Lord has created a new thing on the earth. A woman encircles a man. Now, people have got really confused about this verse. And some people say, well, this is a, is a picture, a promise of the virgin birth of Messiah. And I don't think so. And... Uh, uh, there are no shortage of people with opinions about what that means. I like to find my opinions in the Bible um, more than in a commentary and then try to, to develop what's going on from what the Bible says. And it's interesting because in Deuteronomy 32, 9 and 10, it says this, But the Lord's portion is his people. Jacob, the broken man, his allotted heritage. He found him in a, desert, in a desert land and in the howling waste of the wilderness. And what's it say he did? He encircled him. What was, what's that mean? God's, God's uh, protecting, guarding, covering. When the Lord is talking about the return of the south into his presence, I think he's alluding to the concept of peace. And he's saying, look, we don't need Armies, we're not going to need all the things of the ancient world. A woman will be able to encircle a man. 
Your woman will protect you. She's the one who, who will be your covering. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, once more, they shall use these words in the land of Judah and in its cities when I restore their fortunes. When you come back to me, when you do what we talked about in Zechari- Zechariah chapter 12, and they look on him whom they have pierced, and they mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. When they come to that restoration that Paul talked about in Revelation chapter 11, when they're grafted in again, he's saying, a woman will encircle a man. It's a picture of peace. There's no more war. They're going to take their weapons and beat them into plows. And man will study war no more. A study of war, that's everywhere right now, no? It covers everybody. Everybody affected by it, touched by it. But the Lord says, in my presence, that's, that's not going to be when I restore your fortunes. The Lord bless you, O habitation of righteousness, O holy hill. Zion, the hill of Zion, where is it? Jerusalem, where God said, I'm, that's, that's my home. I'll meet you there, there in that place. I'll meet you. And Judah and all its cities shall dwell there together, and the farmers and those who wander with their flocks. Listen, for I will satisfy the weary soul. And every languishing soul I will replenish. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's all in him. I will satisfy. The older I get, the less things satisfy. As we get old, we say things like, when I was a kid, you never had to lock your door. Well, just so we can be clear, I still don't lock my door. If you want to steal one of my cars, the keys are in it. Knock yourself out. Uh, The keys for the bike are in my pocket, though you're going to have to knock me out to get that. (laughs) But... You know, the, the idea, right, that things were better once upon a time. But the reality is, man's been broken a long time. And we've been doing this same cycle since Genesis. This might be new for our nation, but this is not new for man. Man has been doing this a long time. Look what it says in verse 26. At this I awoke and looked And my sleep was pleasant to me. So this picture of restoration that we've gone all the way through 26. That's all the further we'll go. The new covenant comes in the next verse. So all the way to 26, laying the groundwork. This picture of restoration, right? The nation of Israel being restored. Now how's that going to be accomplished? That's not going to be accomplished because God's just going to say, I'm going to make a special deal and they'll all be forgiven. And, you know, we'll just, that's not how it happens. How does it happen? How does that restoration take place? Through the new covenant. How do they overcome the failures of the old covenant? By the new covenant. The promises that God has for them in the rest of Jeremiah 31. I thought 40 verses might be a little long. But I hope as we look at it, you can just go, you know, there's there's so much... So it just blows my mind how much, just as we've been going through Jeremiah, how, how the Word of God, the Bible says the Word of God is living and powerful. And it just, you know, it doesn't matter where you are. It doesn't matter what time you read this. Of the 1300s, the guy sitting down reading Jeremiah would have said, man, this is just like our world today. And here we are in 2020. Now, I might argue with that guy. No, it's more like our world. But hey. The Bible's alive because the failures of men, the cycle of mistakes and failures that men make, they've been repeating themselves for all of human history. But God also tells us how to cure that. So next week we'll jump into that, the new covenant. 
don't be afraid or dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Amen? Why don't you stand with me? Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to open up Scripture, Lord, to see the promises that you lay out for us. God, I just, uh, as I was preparing and looking at this and uh, choosing songs for tonight, I just uh, was overwhelmed with hope because we will see a victory. It's not a question of how this works out. We know how it works out. We know that the only true king is Jesus Christ. We know that the only true justice is when he rules and reigns on earth as in heaven. So Lord, we look forward to that day. But God, you've given us charge. You commissioned us to make disciples, to baptize and teach. Paul challenged us to be ready in season and out to preach the word. What's the word? The word preach is not what I'm doing tonight. The word preach is to herald the truth of who Jesus Christ is. He's the answer. He's the satisfaction that we long for. He's the hope that we lean in. He is the rest that we need. Lord, may we be filled with hope of the victory that Christ won at the cross that was exclaimed in power when the stone over a tomb was vaporized. May we comprehend with all the saints what is the height, depth, width, and breadth of the love of God which is centered in Christ Jesus our Lord. And may we freely give what we have freely received. And in and through it all, God, may you be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Psych. Weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail No, my God will never fail well, I'm gonna see a victory I'm gonna see a victory For the battle belongs to you, Lord I'm gonna see a victory I'm going to see a victory, for the battle belongs to you, Lord. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus. Every war he wages, he will win. So I'm not backing down from any giant Cause I know how this story ends I know how this story ends well, I'm 
gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. Oh, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. Oh, I'm going to see a victory. I'm going to see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. You take what the enemy meant for evil. You turn it for good. You turn it for good. God bless you guys. Have a good night.